I'm Mary, Mary of Nazareth. I grew up listening to my father talk about the greatness of our people, the chosen people. I remember when I was memorizing the Psalms and learning about the promises of God to send the Messiah, I would look out and see all the powerful Roman soldiers. I despised their arrogance and cruelty, and I would pray for the coming of the Messiah, who would make us a nation and restore the glory that we once had. One evening while I was praying, an angel appeared before me. He visited me, Mary, a poor girl from a no-name town. Impossible, but it really happened. The angel told me that I would become the mother of the Messiah, even though I was still a virgin. I trembled as I agreed to let this amazing thing happen to me, even though I couldn't imagine how such a thing could be. But the angel said that nothing is impossible with God. I still trembled as I tried to picture what was ahead of me, for my baby would be the Messiah. A short time after that, I was invited to go down and visit my relative Elizabeth. Before I even got to her house and said my first word, she told me that she was honored to be visited by the mother of her Lord. She called my son her Lord. Then the truth became real to me. I really had been visited by the angel. God had chosen me. I couldn't keep quiet anymore. I had to sing my praise to God. I stayed with Elizabeth for three months, but I knew I had to get home and tell my mother and father and Joseph the news. How would they take it? How could they possibly believe that I was still a virgin and that my son was the son of God? Joseph was deeply hurt and upset and decided to divorce me quietly. That still wouldn't save me from my shame. What was God asking of me? But I knew everything would be okay when God sent an angel down to Joseph. The angel told Joseph to take me as his wife and that everything would be okay because my son would save our people from their sins. The angel told Joseph that we should name the son Jesus. So Joseph agreed to marry me and he would take me to live with his family. During these last few weeks of my pregnancy, there had been one thing I'd been wondering about. The prophets had said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but we live here in Nazareth. <laughs> You're not going to believe this, but the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, has just declared that a census be held in our region, which means if we want to be counted, we have to travel to Bethlehem. God must have had something to do with this. I would love to stay and tell you more, but I haven't packed yet, and soon I'll be leaving for Bethlehem. A young girl, 13 or 14 years of age, most likely. A no-name town, Nazareth. That is where the story of the birth of Christ begins. Today as we begin a new sermon series, the journey, the, the road from Nazareth to Bethlehem, today we look at Mary of Nazareth and we look at the Annunciation. And over the course of the next several weeks as we prepare our hearts for Christmas Eve, we are going to take some time to, to answer some questions the three primary questions that we're going to try to answer, and I, I want to call your attention to something as we begin. Hopefully you have a sermon notes and study guide there in your bulletin. I invite you to take out the study guide because there's some space there on the front of the sheet there for you to write some notes. I can assure you that something will, will come up over this week or the next several weeks where you're going to write it down and you're going to want to remember or reference a scripture again. And so I want to invite you to take some time to, to, to take some notes today because this is a story that... that most of the world is familiar with. In fact, I could probably ask you to give me some of the details, and many of you could, could tell me what the story is about. But at the end of the day, uh, this is a story that if we really look deeply into the details and we begin to ask ourselves some questions, we'll see that, that God and his character are revealed in the details in this story. And so the first question that we're going to ask, and we're going to look at this every week of the series, the question is this, what does this story teach us about the character of God? So when we begin to look at Mary 
as a young woman, as, as we begin to look at the town of Nazareth and where Mary was from, what does this teach us about the character of God? The second question that we're going to look, look at this week and in the weeks to come is, what does this story teach us about the child whose birth we celebrate? So as we think about Jesus, the Christ child, what does this story tell us about Christ? And then finally, the question that will be throughout the series, and that is, what does this mean for our lives today? What does this story mean for us? As a people of faith, some 2,000 years after this occurred, what does it mean for our lives? Because we believe that this word is living and transformative, and it must mean something for us. And so we're going to ask God to reveal that to us. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter. Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 36. And uh, out of respect for reading the Gospel, I want to invite you to stand. If you are able to stand, I invite you to stand as I read of the birth of Jesus foretold. Hear now the word of God. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am still a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Mary replied, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Amen. I invite you to have a seat. Nazareth. A small town, a no-name town. As we begin this journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, I call your attention there to the map. It may be hard for you to see, but you can notice there in the land portion, it says Galilee, and it's right above where there's a lake that looks like an upside-down water droplet. That is known as the Sea of Galilee. And you can see there, Nazareth there in bold print. That's where the line begins. That's where the journey begins. And that's where we are today. As we consider the town of Nazareth, we need to understand that it is worth looking at this town and its qualities because in doing so, it might tell us a little bit about the character of God. Now, Nazareth is much more widely known today than it ever was in Jesus' day. They didn't know about this town. Um, just to give you an idea of how off the grid this town was, in the Hebrew Talmud, which is all the rabbinic teachings in the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith, There are 63 Galilean villages that are mentioned in the Talmud. Nazareth is not one of them. Of 63 Galilean villages mentioned in the Talmud, not a single one references Nazareth. The historian Josephus, first century historian, who knew the area well, lists 45 towns and villages in Galilee. Nazareth is not a single one of them. 45 towns, 63 towns. Nazareth doesn't even make the top 63. Friends, do you even see that many names on the map? I I wonder why would Jesus choose a a young woman, 13 or 14 years of old age, from, from a town that isn't even on the map in that day? Maybe this tells us something about the character of God. 
When talking about Nazareth, a native of the region at this time might just have well said that uh, they would have never told you they lived in Nazareth. They would have said, oh, I lived near the town of Sephorus. It was about four miles away. Sephorus had a proxi- uh, proximate population of about 30,000 people and was well known, while Nazareth at the, at the time had a population of somewhere between 100 and 400 people. It would be like someone from New York City or Los Angeles coming to you and saying, where in Texas do you live? You wouldn't say, I live in Argyle. You might. You could say Argyle or Copper Canyon or Double Oak or Ponder or Crum or Sanger. Uh, you could say that, but they'd look at you and go, where? where where's Argyle? Um, you wouldn't even say, I live near Flower Mound or Denton. Somebody from those parts of the world wouldn't even probably know Flower Mound or Denton. No, you would say, I'm from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That's where we live. Because that would be the closest thing that they would even know or understand. And so Mary and her family would have never probably told you that they were from Nazareth. They said, oh, we're, we're outside of Sephora. I've got a video that I want to show you of modern day Sephora that's um, now ruins uh, there's not much of a town there anymore but uh, this would have been the central market area I had a chance to go to the Holy Land three years ago and this is some video that Jonathan was able to secure so I could kind of talk it through uh, it's amazing that you can walk all over and around the exhibits these are tile floors that they uncovered so this would have been in the entryway of a home look at the beautiful flooring there they had mosaic tile floors I mean this was a wealthy area this town uh, of Sephora. Uh, there's another one. Um, look at that just beautiful mosaic tile work. You can walk right up to these things. In some cases, you can walk on them. Can you believe that? I mean, they'd never allow that in our museums here. It's amazing how close you can get to the artifacts in the Holy Land. If you've never had an opportunity, I hope that sometime during the course of your life, you get an opportunity to, to walk in those areas of the world. As I, I think about Mary and her being from Nazareth, and we think about uh, the big town that was just four miles away, it's likely that Mary and her family would have been workers in Sephora. They would have walked the four miles every day, commuted about an hour to work and an hour from work. It would have taken them about an hour probably to have walked the four miles. And they would have worked there in the town or around the town. There would have been day laborers. I wonder, I wonder if Mary... Um, She refers to herself in another portion of Scripture as a maiden. I wonder if she indeed was a servant girl and if she would have mopped some of those tile floors. Could you imagine that she would have come in during the week and worked in the homes and cleaned around the houses? She would have been a a very much of a, a poor servant laborer. This is the type of person that God chose to be the mother of the Christ child. What does this say about the character of God? As I look at this and I think about those whom God favors and those whom God chooses to to do his purposes through, I think of the setting and I think that, that first and foremost, the quality of a person that God chooses is one of humility. That's something worth writing down, that God chooses humble and meek people. That when God called Mary, one of the things that she responds is immediately just, I, I'm surprised. Who, me? The scripture says that she was afraid, but I don't think she was afraid of the angel. I think she was afraid of the message. What is it you're asking me to do? God chooses the least likely to accomplish his work. God chose a town, Nazareth. A no-name town. When I think of Nazareth, I think of all those little towns in Texas, you know, all over the state that nobody even knows the name of. They're the type of towns that if you lived in, there's no internet. There aren't any restaurants. There's no movie theater. Kids that live in those towns have to drive to other bigger towns to go to school. They would never tell you that they're from that town, and if they did, you'd go, where? This is Nazareth. I mean, I picture it in my mind I mean the only thing that those small towns might brag about is their six-man football team you know I mean that's that's what those little towns do right as I, I think about that I think this is the type of town that God chose that the young woman that God chose lived in one of these no-name towns but the people that live in these no-name towns they're 
They're not pretentious. They're humble. They're meek. They say, who, me? You would use me? Just to give you an idea of Nazareth's low social status, in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, when Philip, one of Jesus' first disciples, is talking to his friend Nathaniel, he says, hey, we found him. We found the one that Moses and the law spoke of. We found the one that the prophets have been mentioned. Basically saying, we found the Messiah. We found the Savior. His name is Jesus. He's son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathaniel's reply to Philip, can anything good come from Nazareth? That was his reply. This is the town where the young woman who God chose lived. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Why would God choose a place like Nazareth and find a young woman to bear the Christ child? Why would God choose to, a village that was so looked down upon that it didn't even mention in the history books? That the only reason we know about it now is because God chose it. Maybe that's why God chose it. Maybe God could have chosen for the story to take place in Sephora, among the wealthy living in their lavish villages and villas and estates. But instead, God chose to work amongst the poor, the working class, some who even lived in caves and lived along the margins of society. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but God chose an enslaved people to be his chosen people. God called the youngest of Jesse's seven shepherding sons, right, David, remember the youngest? To be the greatest king in Israel's history. Paul says to the Corinthian church, this is an interesting statement that Paul says, maybe it gives us a little bit an idea of why God chooses whom he chooses. Paul says this, but God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses the weak things in the world to shame the strong. God chooses the lowly things in the world and the despised things and the things that are not so as to nullify the things that are. And the reason God does this is that no one may boast before him. Maybe this says something about the character of God, that God looks for the meek and humble to use for his greatest purposes, and Mary of Nazareth is just such a person. I want to look more closely at Mary, the mother of Christ. We know she lived in this out-of-the-way town. We know that she was likely uneducated and probably came from a poor family. She may have been a servant, may have even worked in one of the households in Sephora, may have even mopped the floors we saw. Whatever the case may be, Mary was not a person who thought that the world revolved around her. In fact, it's obvious from her own admission in Luke chapter 1. This is a passage of scripture we call the Magnificat. You may have heard this before, the Magnificat, the Annunciation. This is when the angel has appeared and she says back, it's called Mary's song. It's after the angels appeared and she's time later. She says this, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. This is a young woman who literally when God says I'm going to use you for something great, she literally says, who me? You're, you're going to take ordinary me and do something extraordinary? Friends, I think we ought to have that kind of posture in our own lives. I, I want to give you a little of the back story. hope it doesn't take away anything from the drama, but um, we chose Maddie because of her age. We wanted one of our students to be Mary because most likely Mary was 13, 14 years of age. You, you may think, oh, that's, that's awful young, and it is. Now, we are 13 and 14-year-olds. We would never consider old enough to, to start a family. But in this time, in Jesus' time, in Mary's time, uh, when the life expectancy was probably a little less than 35, you became a woman, a young woman, as soon as you were able to bear children. And so most likely, Mary, at this age, was now able to bear children. She would have entered into what we would call a year-long formal engagement. She was betrothed to marry Joseph. And so they would have had this formal engagement for a year, and then they would have consummated their marriage, and then Mary would have began in 
having a family. It would have been expected that if she were able, she would have had a child almost every year throughout her childbearing years. That seems crazy to us. But you have to understand at this time, the infant mortality rate, which was very, very high, and the mortality rate of mothers during the childbirthing process, how many of them died um, at the giving of birth of their first child, much less the ability to have multiple children over the course of their childbearing years. This is the the person that, that God chose. I have to confess that when I was calling Maddie's mom, it was weird. I said, hey, we've got the costume, Miss Liz in the children's department. She's got a costume for Maddie. Um, but I, this sounds so weird, me asking you this. Uh, can you and Jay make sure that uh, Maddie's pregnant on Sunday? <laughs> Bonnie just, I mean, the silence that I got back. was, like, you know, I said, I know this sounds weird. She just has to look pregnant. We shudder at the thought, don't we? And yet here was what many of us would call a child being, being asked to do such an incredible, miraculous thing. You know, I think sometimes we get so focused on the details and, and um, we start thinking, well, how can this happen in modern day science and all that? Guys, I don't think the gospel writers cared anything about biology. I think they were thinking about theology. I think they wanted the world to know that it was God who was at the center of this story. It was God who gave us the missing DNA. I mean, we know how it works. It takes a man, it takes a woman. But, but I just don't think they, they cared about biology. I don't think they cared about science. I just think they wanted us to know they call Mary Theotokos, the theologians. They just want us to know that this is God. God is the center of this. Sometimes we look at Mary and we, we think of the Catholics and their understanding of Mary, their veneration of Mary. And we think the Protestants typically think, well, they, they put too much emphasis on Mary. I think that we don't put enough emphasis on Mary in our contexts. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but, but Mary was the closest human being to Jesus ever. This is the woman who gave birth to Jesus. This is the woman who held the baby that cried and that she sang lullabies to and that she fed from her breast. This is the woman who taught Jesus what it meant to, to love God. Could you imagine her singing those lullabies? Could you imagine Mary changing those diapers? I mean, this was the closest human being to Jesus ever. Couldn't we learn something from her? Why would God choose such an unlikely candidate? You know, Mary, mature enough to marry or not, mature enough to have children, we know, but Mary was no better prepared for the visit of the angel than any of us would have been. You may remember from our October sermon series, Twilight, you guys we're here with us on that. We looked at the existence of angels, demons, spirits, and ghosts. And here we have a story where we have the appearance of an angel. You remember we taught you this in that series, that the Greek word for angel means messenger. And sometimes we imagine angels as winged creatures with halos and white robes. But evidence suggests more likely that Gabriel appeared to Mary as an ordinary man. There's no indication in Scripture that she was terrified by his appearance at all. It says she was afraid, but we believe she was afraid more because of the message. Throughout history, this message has been referred to as the Annunciation, okay? And it's celebrated as the announcement by the angel Gabriel that the Virgin Mary would conceive and become the mother of Jesus. And we call this conception, if you will, and later birth, the Incarnation. Literally, the word becoming flesh. That's what we call this in theology, the incarnation. And so this announcement, this annunciation, scholars believe it happened in one of two places. I want to show you another video clip here in Nazareth. It's the Cathedral of the Annunciation or the Basilica of the Annunciation. This is the Catholic holy site, all right? And they believe uh, that's there, the large structure there in the, in the distance. And you're zooming in. Um, beautiful, beautiful building. The most recent facilities that you see, I believe, were built in the 60s. 
Um, you can see here, doesn't that look like you're going underneath an overpass? All right. The reason why those pillars are like that and those piers and beams is that this is built over the site. This is what we'd call a tell. Uh, that when older societies began to, to crumble down and disintegrate, they'd just build right on top of it. And so over um, this site where this church is built, if you go down, uh, and it's going to pan down here, and you're going to see it comes through the floor. Uh, let it come down just a little bit more. You can see the beautiful mosaics and stained glass windows. There's there the big hole in the floor of the church. And then down below, as you start to get down underneath, there's another chapel. And then down below that is this. A little cove, and you can see past the table, you see the little light? There's a cave back there. And many scholars and historians in the Catholic Church has claimed that this is where Mary was when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. That very likely, Mary and her family lived in a cave. Talk about poor. It was pretty common for people to live in caves in that day. In fact, people still use caves this day in the Holy Land for shelters for animals. In some cases, the impoverished live in caves still. And so the Catholic Church is built over this site, believing that this is the cave uh, that was very likely a home or someone's home in her family. Or if it's not, um, they're still charging a lot of admission to come in and see it. <laughs> All right? It's not cheap. But it's amazing the feeling you get when you come down into what they call the grotto. It's amazing that even with the crowds, it gets real quiet down there. And if you listen, you can almost feel like you hear or sense that, boy, I could see God's speaking to someone in this place, even with all the stuff that's built around. Now, the Orthodox Church, on the other hand, has an alternative view and understanding of where the Annunciation took place. They believe that it took place at the spring, um, where the town was founded some two to three hundred years, maybe four hundred years before uh, the time of Mary, the town of Nazareth would have been founded uh, and it would have been built around a natural spring. There are natural springs in the area. And so I want to show you another video clip. Uh, this is the Orthodox Church uh, that you're going to see. <clears throat> very, very different, uh, much older, not nearly as elaborate as the Catholics. Um, there is a, a mosaic there, a painting, if you will, of um, Mary there at the, the spring getting water and the angel. Um, notice that the decor for the Orthodox is quite different. The dark woods, the, the, see the icons? All the painted icons and the incense. Um, you would go down, this is down below the church. Uh, you would then take this on down and then you'll see here, they're gonna show the video's gonna pan down with a little bit of audio. Here is the... This is way below ground now. This would have been at ground level, street level. At the time, could you imagine Mary doing what she would have done every day, going to fetch water and finding an angel that appeared to, to give her a message? I, I show this with you just to try to help you get in your mind's eye what it might have been like. Again, I don't, I don't know whether the angel appeared in a home or the angel appeared near the water of the spring. I, it doesn't really matter to me. I don't know the details of how God worked it out. What really matters to me, and I think what ought to matter to us this first Sunday of Advent, is that, that God chose an unlikely, humble candidate. A young woman whose immediate response was, who, me? You want to take ordinary me and do something extraordinary for the world? I want to ask you to consider this morning as we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion that you might be open to what God might be calling you to this holiday. As we enter into this Advent season, as we break, if you will, as we slow down this Christmas, I pray that you would just walk slow enough and in enough humility that you might say, okay, God, what, what do you want to do through me? How might you use me not that I would get the glory, but Lord, that you would be glorified. How could our words be like Mary's? I praise God, I glorify God, because God has remembered his humble servant. A 13-year-old girl from a no-name town. What does this say about the character of God? I think very clearly God chooses the least likely to accomplish his most important work. And I want to ask you, as you consider how this might work in your life today, 
What if? What if among us today, God is calling someone into ministry? I, I share with you a story a couple years ago. Actually, this goes back, gosh, probably about seven years ago. A woman who lived in the town at the time, she came up to the church one day and she said, Pastor, I want to talk with you about uh, something I've been praying about. And I said, sure, let's, let's talk about it. She said, I've been praying and I feel God has revealed to me that I am going to be the pastor of a really large ministry, she said. She said, it's going to be a ministry that changes the world. It's going to be known all over the world. And I said, really? I said, um, that's, that's amazing. I said, um, she told me a little bit more about it. I said, well, she said, but I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, well, I, God hasn't done it yet, and it's been a long time, and I just I feel like it's supposed to happen now. And I said, well, tell me about what you're involved in now. What ministry are you involved in now? And she looked at me, and she, she didn't say anything. I said, what ministry are you involved in now? And she said, well, I'm not involved in a ministry right now. And I said, do you mean, no offense here, but you mean to tell me that, that God is going to put you in charge of this incredible, world-renowned, well-known ministry, uh, and that's what you believe God is calling you to do, but, but you're not even involved in a ministry now at all? I said, hey, uh, listen, I, I don't know, I don't, I'm not going to speak for God, but how is God going to entrust some huge ministry to you if you're not even involved in a no-name small ministry now? Don't you feel like you ought to be a good steward of something insignificant? And then if you're able to at least demonstrate good stewardship, that maybe God will then bless you, if, if, you, I mean, if that's what you want to call it, that God will put you in charge of more. And so I took the opportunity. I said, I, I, if you'd like to be involved in an insignificant ministry that nobody really knows about, why don't you join Argyle Methodist Church? And I said, be a part of this. There, there's not much going on here right now. It's pretty small. This, again, this is about seven, eight years ago. And I said, I can get you involved. You can volunteer. You can come to worship. And I, I'm saddened to tell you, she never took me up on the offer. She ended up moving away. I, I have to tell you, if she had gotten on board then, she'd be involved with a really significant ministry now. I mean, one that everybody knows about, right? Talk to my mother. She knows all about Argyle Methodist Church. We're unknown all the way in Irving, Texas. I share that story with you to say this. God chooses the humble. No offense to the woman that I had the conversation with who doesn't even live in this area anymore. I... I just share that with you to say this. I think God's looking for people that say, who, me? Really? And then trust God enough to do what God chooses to do. Amen? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time in which you can prepare our hearts for the coming of your, your, your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we give our gifts to you now at this time and as we prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion, I pray that, that as we offer our commitments, as we offer our gifts, that these gifts might truly represent a sacrifice and, and prayer and discernment, that we've actually taken the time to consider what we might give to you, that we realize everything we have is yours already. So Lord, receive our gifts in the spirit in which we offer them, that they might glorify you and be used for the building of your kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.